In the opening of the Tractatus, Wittgenstein says that the world is the totality of facts, not of things. There is the fact that you are watching this video, the fact that the sky is blue, the fact that electrons have negative charge, and so forth. If you put all these facts together, then, according to Wittgenstein, you get the world. Now, I believe there are good reasons to think that facts are in the mind. If I'm right about this, and if Wittgenstein is right about facts constituting the world, then the world itself is in the mind. This is a view called idealism, and I believe idealism to be the correct view of reality. This video presents my case. I'll begin with a consideration of the nature of truth and move on to draw conclusions about the nature of existence. Where I'll end up is with a claim that facts are true thoughts. Everything that exists, exists in facts. So to exist means nothing more than to be a constituent in a true thought. Everything, therefore, is in thought, and existence itself comes from truth. Now, I can't promise this argument will be a simple one or a short one, but I can promise to do my best to make it as understandable as possible, and I'm going to go step by step as clearly and carefully as I can. I hope it will be quite a ride, so grab your brains, pour yourself a strong coffee, and let's go. I'm going to start with one of the earliest definitions of truth made by Aristotle, who says, to say of what is that it is not, or of what is not that it is, is false. While to say of what is that it is, and of what is not that it is not, is true. Here, Aristotle gets at the intuitive idea that what is true or false are the things we say, and that what makes the things we say true or false are how things are. This is a pretty good start, but let's try to get a little more precise than that. In this quote, we get an indication of two basic questions we must answer when we're considering the nature of truth. Number one, what are the truth bearers? In other words, what are the things that can be true or false? Number two, what are the truth makers? In other words, what are the things that determine the truth or falsity of the truth bearers? Now, to understand truth in terms of truth bearers and truth makers is to naturally adopt a certain theory about truth. This is a theory that says that truth is a matter of a relationship between two kinds of things. In this case, it's a relationship between truth bearers and truth makers. Theories of this sort are called correspondence theories, and they are the most popular and intuitive of the truth theories philosophers discuss. Correspondence theories say that truth bearers are true when they correspond to a truth maker, and truth bearers are false when they don't correspond to one. To interpret Aristotle's rough theory in terms of a correspondence theory of truth, it would claim that what we say is true when it corresponds to how things are, and what we say is false when it doesn't correspond to how things are. So let's go with the correspondence theory for now and start by asking what the truth bearers might be. We'll get onto the truth makers in a bit. Whatever truth bearers are, they need to fulfill two roles. First, they need to be the things we believe, because we can believe true things and false things. So they must be the contents of beliefs. Secondly, they need to be the things we say because we can say true things and we can say false things. The popular option these days is to say that truth bearers are propositions. But what are propositions? If you think about propositions as things you say, it's quite natural to think of them as sentences. In that case, truth bearers would be pieces of language. They would be things you can write down on a piece of paper or things you can say out loud. In which case, the truth bearers would be things in the world. They would be sequences of symbols or sounds carried in the air. But one problem with the idea of sentences being truth bearers is that sentences don't seem to be the right kind of entity for being true or false. Other kinds of objects in the world, like a leaf, a rock, or the Eiffel Tower, just seem to be the wrong sort of entity to be true or false. We can sensibly ask whether they exist, 
but not sensibly ask whether they are true. Similarly, if a sentence is a sequence of symbols or a sound carried on the air, it seems more appropriate to ask whether it exists than whether it is true. And also, is what we believe a sentence? It doesn't seem to be. It's not the sentence that we believe, but what the sentence means. And if truth was something a sentence could have independently of its meaning, that truth would have to be based solely on the words the sentence contained. But that doesn't seem to be the case, especially when you think about a sentence that can have different meanings. For example, in the US, the word pants refers to what we in the UK call trousers, and what we in the UK call pants refers to what those in the US call underwear. But whether the sentence Ryan Gosling likes to wear pink pants in public is true or not, will depend not merely on the sentence itself, but on what that sentence means. Probably. So if propositions are to be truth bearers, they don't seem to be sentences themselves, but the meanings of our sentences. Now, when we say that propositions are the meanings of sentences, we need to be a little bit careful, because they're not the meanings of all sentences. Some sentences are used just to express emotions like hooray for absolute philosophy. And others are used to make requests like please hit like and subscribe to my channel. Sentences like this don't have meanings that can be true or false, so they can't mean a proposition. Meanings that are true or false are the meanings of descriptive sentences. Sentences that are used to describe the way things are. Sentences like, the sky is blue. So from now on, when I'm talking about sentences, I only mean to refer to descriptive ones. OK, let's quickly assess where we've come. If propositions are our truth bearers, they have to be the meanings of our sentences, the things that we say and the contents of our beliefs. But then what are propositions? What are meanings? Most importantly for our discussion, are meanings abstract entities, mental entities, or physical ones? Interestingly, two great philosophers, Gottlob Frege and Bertrand Russell, had a discussion about this in some letters they sent to each other, the implications of which are quite staggering. Frege thought that meaning had two aspects to it, sense and reference. I've done a full video on Frege's influential theory about this in the card above me and linked in the description. But for our current purposes, what's important is that Frege thought it was the sense of a sentence that could be true or false, what he called the thought the sentence expressed. Physical objects, Frege said, could be referred to by the names in the sentence. So they weren't part of the sentence's sense. They weren't part of the thought. As he says to Russell in his letter, Mont Blanc, with all its snowfields, is not itself a component part of the thought that Mont Blanc is more than 4,000 metres high. Russell's view at the time was very different to Frege's. He didn't think that meanings of sentences came in two varieties. He thought there was only one meaning, and that was the proposition. And he thought that propositions were made of things in the world itself. He writes in reply, I believe that in spite of all its snowfields, Mont Blanc itself is a component part of what is actually asserted in the proposition, Mont Blanc is more than 4,000 metres high. We do not assert the thought, we assert the object of the thought. And this is, to my mind, a certain complex, an objective proposition, one might say, in which Mont Blanc is itself a component part. If we do not admit this, then we get the conclusion that we know nothing at all about Mont Blanc itself. So Russell thinks that the meaning of the sentence Mont Blanc is more than 4,000 metres high includes, among other things, Mont Blanc itself, the alpine mountain with all its snowfields. If Russell is right about this, then propositions are mind-independent complexes that include physical objects. In which case, truth bearers would also be 
mind-independent complexes, including physical objects. Part of what made Russell adopt this view, as he admits in his letter, is that he believed a view like Frege's that had thoughts as the truth bearers might lead us to conclude that we know nothing at all about objects in the world themselves, a position that he subsequently feared might eventually lead to idealism. Now this correspondence between Frege and Russell took place in 1904. Frege never abandoned his theory, but Russell did. By 1910, Russell's view had changed dramatically, and it changed again in 1912, and again in 1913, and again in 1918, and by 1919, Russell finally gave up the possibility of finding a suitable theory that had physical objects as parts of propositions. Now, I won't bore you with all the details of the various problems Russell came up with when trying to establish a theory of this sort, but one of the major problems he had is quite intuitive and easy to grasp and is also quite instructive. It seems clear that some sentences, such as the moon is made of cheese, are perfectly meaningful and yet also clearly false. So there must be false propositions as well as true ones. But if propositions contain real world mind independent complexes, then what are false propositions? They would also be mind-independent complexes consisting of objects, properties, and relations. In which case, what distinguishes true propositions from false ones? They both would be mind-independent complexes of objects, properties, and relations. In which case, false propositions sound an awful lot like facts. And that's bad. Nobody wants it to be a fact that the moon is made of cheese. Since Russell had such a hard time making a theory of this sort work, despite his many attempts, let's just rule out the possibility of propositions being physical entities. That leaves us with the other two options. Maybe propositions are abstract entities, like numbers or mathematical sets. Those that take that view are called Platonists about propositions. Alternatively, perhaps propositions are mental entities, like thoughts or ideas. Those that take that option are called conceptualists about propositions. Platonists present an argument that says that propositions cannot be mental entities. Take a proposition like 2 plus 2 is 4. This proposition would be true, they say, even if there were no minds. This is an argument from possibility, and an argument from considerations of time suggests something similar. Consider when the universe was first coming into being. Presumably at that time there were no minds, but 2 plus 2 was still 4, right? I mean, if two planets form from dust clouds one moment, and another two planets form from dust clouds the next, there would be 4 planets. So if propositions can be true without minds, the Platonist argues they must exist without minds too, in which case they cannot be mental entities. Now I think the Platonist has a good point here about the eternal nature of truths and the necessary nature of some truths, but I don't find their conclusion very compelling. It just seems obvious to me that since the Platonist agrees that propositions are the contents of my beliefs, the contents of my thinking, and what I comprehend and understand when hearing a sentence, these must be mental entities of a sort. How can what I'm thinking not be best understood as a thought? In which case, it should best be understood also as a mental entity. In reply to the Platonist's argument, I would say that either it is not possible for there to be no mind because there is eternally and necessarily some mind, or it is possible for there to be no mind, but in such a case there would be no propositions either. In any case, the Platonist has their own difficulties to contend with. One involves explaining how it is we can come to know about these mind-independent abstract entities that we can't perceive. If there is no mechanism by which they can interact with our mind, how is it that we are able to grasp them? Another issue with Platonism concerns the identity and properties of these supposed objects. Since they are, by hypothesis, mind independent, we have no reason to associate them with the content they produce in our mind when we grasp them. 
and there are several suitable candidates for what these objects might be, yet they can't all be those objects without contradiction. And we're left with no principled way of deciding which object is which proposition. And yet a principle of individuation is typically thought to be necessary for any independent objects. In short, Platonism has problems both technical and epistemic. For now, let's put the Platonist option to the side and pick up the views of Frege, who believes, like me, that truth bearers are thoughts. Does that mean that Frege is a conceptualist? Yes, but his conceptualism is of a specific kind and needs some nuance. Frege believed, as the Platonist does, that there can be truth bearers that no one ever thinks or says. And he believes that the things that are true are true eternally. In fact, Frege believed that thoughts themselves were eternal and that when we think them, we merely come into a certain relationship with them by grasping them with our mind. Frege argues for this view by pointing out that the things we believe and say aren't private parts of our psychology. They are fundamentally public entities capturable in language. They're the things that we can communicate to each other, we can disagree about and teach to our children. Further, when we discover a new truth, say by proving a new theorem of mathematics, Frege thinks this is a process of discovery. The theorem always was true, it's just that now we have managed to grasp that thought and recognise its truth. Since thoughts are public, discoverable but invisible entities, Frege distinguishes them from two other kinds of things. First, there are the private inner psychological goings on of our mind, which he calls ideas, and then there is the world of external objects presented by our senses. In contrast to these, Frege says that thoughts exist within a third realm, a realm of external but imperceptible objects. For an example of how this works, Imagine that I say to you that horses are beautiful creatures. Perhaps when I said that, in my mind I pictured a black stallion galloping through a field. And when you heard it, you imagined a white mare gently grazing. The stallion and the mare are what are private to us. They are our private inner ideas. But what was publicly communicated when I said that was the thought that horses are beautiful creatures. According to Frege, the thought and ideas exist in different realms, and both of these realms are again different to the physical horses grazing in the paddock. From what I've said so far, Frege might seem like a confused kind of Platonist, using the word thoughts to refer to what are ultimately mind-independent abstract entities in a third realm. But I think that's wrong, and a small remark he makes presents us with a very intriguing alternative. He says that although thoughts are not the contents of consciousness owned by individual men, they could be understood as the contents of the mind, of the mind, not of minds. I think this remark is very telling. It paints a picture of Frege distinguishing between the private contents of our individual minds and the publicly accessible mind in which we all participate through the use of our reason and language. Ideas are in our individual minds, while thoughts are in the mind. And since thoughts are eternal, this mind must itself also be eternal. And if that was a remarkable thing to say, Frege also says something remarkable about facts. Facts, 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 cries the scientist if he wants to bring home the necessity of a firm foundation for science. What is a fact? A fact is a thought that is true. So Frege thinks that facts are true thoughts. And if true thoughts are in the mind, then facts must be in the mind as well. If he's right about this, and I think he is, then facts are mental entities. Facts are thoughts in the eternal public mind. Now, I don't want to give the impression that I'm arguing that Frege is an idealist. There are philosophers who point to idealist elements in his thinking, and I agree with them. But the prevailing view is that Frege is a realist, because he believed in reference and in objects presented to our senses. 
And although I have a lot to say about matters of Phrygian interpretation, I even did my PhD thesis on the topic, that's not my intention here, so I'll resist the urge to get distracted. My point in bringing up Frege was to show that the belief that facts are true thoughts has some weighty precedent. There are few philosophers as insightful and respected as Frege, so the view should not be dismissed lightly. But this video is not a simple appeal to authority, no matter how weighty that authority may be. So I first need to argue against the alternative views before I return to Frege's one and develop it further. For now, let's take what we've discussed as giving us good reasons to think that truth bearers are thoughts. And let's now turn our attention to the other important entities, the truth makers. Most theories of truth, unlike Frege's, take facts to be the truth makers and not the truth bearers. The idea is that a proposition is true when it corresponds to a fact. So facts play the role of the entities at the level of existence that determine whether or not a proposition, or what I will now refer to as a thought, is true. If a thought corresponds to a fact, it is true. And if a thought doesn't correspond to a fact, it is false. Going back to Aristotle's original idea of truth as saying of what is that it is, we now get the more precise idea of truth as expressing a thought that corresponds to a fact. Simple. This conception of truth is highly intuitive. Suppose we were to use it to say why the thought that the sky is blue is true. The correspondence to fact theory says that this thought is true because there exists some object, the sky, that has the property of being blue. The blueness of the sky is an existing fact, and it is by corresponding to this fact that the thought that the sky is blue is true. So facts then, according to this theory, are structured entities that exist in reality. They consist of objects and their properties in relations. Basically, they're entities like the things Russell described propositions as being. But in this new theory, facts are not propositions at all. They are entities that exist outside of language, outside of meaning. This idea of truth seems reasonable enough, especially when we're talking about observations like the blueness of the sky or the height of Mont Blanc. But it's not quite as intuitive as it first seems. If this is indeed the theory of truth that we adopt, it should be our theory of truth in all circumstances, across all cases, and not just the cases when we're talking about things we can observe. For example, what about truths like 2 plus 2 is 4? If this is also true because it corresponds to a fact, then there must be a fact out there that consists of the number 2 in a, an addition relation to another number 2 and somehow being equal to 4. Whatever fact this thing is, it's certainly a pretty odd one. And we're also now left with the problem of how we know it is a fact that 2 plus 2 is 4. Because if it wasn't, the thought that 2 plus 2 is 4 would be false. No matter how much it seems true to us, we could simply be mistaken. But this seems to get things backwards. Don't we just see that 2 plus 2 is 4 is true without going out and checking the facts? If anything, we know it must be a fact that 2 plus 2 is 4 because we know that 2 plus 2 is 4 is true. Now you might think that what I've just said isn't right and that we actually do go and check the facts to know that 2 plus 2 is 4. We might get two blocks and then another two blocks and then count to see if there are four blocks. But this isn't a good enough explanation. First, counting these blocks wouldn't actually allow us to say that 2 plus 2 is 4. It would only allow us to say that 2 blocks plus 2 blocks is 4 blocks, and that's not quite the same thing. The fact about blocks is a particular fact about quantities of blocks, but the mathematical claim of 2 plus 2 being 4 is a general claim that can be applied to anything. And even if it sounds plausible to think we check the facts to know that 2 plus 2 is 4, that's clearly not how we know other mathematical truths, like a billion plus six is a billion and six. We don't see that that's true by first counting out a billion blocks, counting out another six, and then recounting to see if we have a billion plus six. Thank goodness. And I don't know how we could, even in principle, 
go out to check the facts for other mathematical truths, such as that the square root of 2 is irrational. To demonstrate that, we have to first recognise a series of thoughts as being connected, and then we infer the truth of the later thoughts on the basis of the truth of the former thoughts. And that's what mathematical proof is. To determine mathematical truths, you don't go out and check the facts. Now, before you think that mathematical truths are some special kind of case over here, and that for all other purposes, correspondence theories of truth are perfectly fine, think a little more about the whole host of ways that we use language descriptively, but not based on direct observation. Consider, for example, the following plausibly true thoughts. The thought that torturing babies is wrong. The thought that Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon on his way to Rome. The thought that if you weren't watching this video right now, you'd be watching something else on YouTube. What could the facts that make these thoughts true be? We might be able to give some explanation of them, but it won't be either obvious or intuitive. Moral truths would require existing moral facts. Facts about the wrongness of torturing babies that somehow exist out there. Historical truths would require existing historical facts. If it is still true that Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon on his way to Rome, it must still be a fact that Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon on his way to Rome. As for truths about what you would otherwise be doing, these would require facts about circumstances other than those that happened. Maybe there are existing facts about possibilities, but they aren't intuitive ones. And then there are truths that are either very general, metaphorical, or seem to involve strange kinds of objects. Consider the following. The thought that politics in the West has become increasingly polarised. The thought that a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush and the thought that the young man enlisted for the sake of the war effort. What fact could make it true that politics has become increasingly polarised in the West? Perhaps there are lots of facts involved, many involving social media posts and comments, but the thought clearly doesn't correspond to any of those facts. Thoughts about birds in hands and bushes aren't really about birds in either hands or bushes, but if there can be truths of this sort, it's hard to know what facts might make them true and how they correspond to the thought expressed. As for thoughts like the one about the soldier, a straight reading of the fact involved would suggest there must be sakes out there in the world belonging to war efforts, and that in some cases people can do things for these sakes. After all, isn't that the kind of fact that would be needed to correspond to the thought and make it true? For most correspondence theorists, however, Belief in things like existing sakes is uncomfortable. Now, I am not suggesting there are no potential responses to these questions by those that defend a correspondence account of truth. The point is only that the way to make this kind of theory work leads to places that are neither simple nor intuitive. Saying that truth is a matter of correspondence is not the end of the matter. It's only the start of a very long and difficult journey. It's got to the point now amongst academic philosophers that adherence to a correspondence theory of truth tends to mean the order of explanation gets reversed. We don't determine what is true by first going out and checking what the facts are. Rather, we use the truths that we know to determine what the facts are. This idea of using truths to determine what the facts are might seem really bizarre, but it's vital to understand for my argument as well as really interesting, so I'm going to slow down and take my time with this bit. Here goes. The way ontology is regularly done in contemporary analytic philosophy is via a logical analysis of language and what the truths of that language say about the nature of existence. This approach is linked to a dictum made by the highly influential 20th century philosopher W.V.O. Quine, who said, to be is to be the value of a bound variable. Let me explain. Somewhat technically, what Quine is taken to have meant by this is that what exists is determined by the things you accept into your logical theory of language. The bound variables in a theory range over, that is, can refer to, the objects in the domain of the theory. And the domain of a theory must include all the objects that that theory talks about. So, by Quine's dictum, the things that exist are the things that your logical theory of language talk about. 
You can think of this approach as mimicking a certain conception of science. You first of all get your best scientific theory, the one you think is probably true, and then you see what that best scientific theory talks about. If your best theory talks about dark matter, strings and the Higgs boson, you say that dark matter, strings and the Higgs boson exist. Similarly, if your best logical theory talks about possible worlds, numbers and sakes, then possible worlds, numbers and sakes exist. The upshot of this approach to existence is that philosophers doing ontology become really careful about what they assert to be true, because the act of asserting something commits them to the existence of the things they are talking about. This means that if they don't want to commit to the existence of dubious entities, they need to find ways of saying the things they think are true without referring to them. The ultimate aim of this project is to construct a language that allows you to express all the truths that there are while only referring to the entities that actually exist. Now this language is a bit unwieldy and impractical for general use, but it is hoped it would be a very precise language that directly mirrored the way reality was. The contemporary philosopher Ted Sider had a name for such a language. He called it ontologies. Here's an example of how this might work. Suppose you think that objects like tables and computers don't really exist in reality, because you think the only things that really exist are the fundamental particles of standard model physics. Everything else you think is just a collection of particles. In that case, instead of saying something like the computer is on the table, you might say something like there are particles arranged computer-wise on top of particles arranged table-wise. Note that this new assertion doesn't talk about computers and tables, it only talks about particles and how they happen to be arranged. So if you can have a language that replaces computer and table talk with talk about particles arranged in various ways, then you could conceivably express everything that you think is true without having to refer to things you don't think exist. Now, once this new language has been constructed, you can then argue that this language is the one that correctly mirrors the structure of reality. In other words, you can argue that this language is ontologies, and it is the true thoughts expressed in ontologies that are the ones that directly correspond to the facts, and so these true thoughts can tell you what the facts are. Simple, right? But now a new problem arises. No doubt there will be multiple theories that make all the same thoughts true, but do so by talking about different things. Let's go back to the computer on the table example. One theory might simply say the computer is on the table, in which case computers must exist and tables must exist. Another theory, however, might simply say that particles arranged computer-wise are on top of particles arranged table-wise, in which case particles exist, but tables and computers don't. But since we can imagine that both theories might be equally plausible in terms of what they say is true, how are we to know whether things like computers and tables exist? The answer would seem to depend upon which theory is the correct theory. But how are we to know this? Now it gets really tricky. If you think existence is a fundamental notion, then you are an ontological realist, which means you think that reality has a certain structure to it that is independent of the way we view it and talk about it. You think that in reality there are objects with properties and relations. In other words, you think that facts exist in reality independently of mind and language. For the ontological realist, the true theory is the theory that corresponds to how things are, and it should precisely correspond to it. That means that the things it refers to should be the things that exist, and the structure of its terms should directly correspond to the structure of the facts such that the language itself mirrors the structure of reality. But in practice, we have no way of knowing what the structure of reality is independently of our thought. We think in terms of language, and so we can't directly peer at reality in a way that doesn't project the structures of our language and thought onto that reality in the process. Without being able to directly peer at the facts, 
it seems we have no way to decide between the different competing theories with their various structures and the entities they say exist. With no way of knowing which theory directly corresponds to the facts, there seems to be no way to use truth to determine which theory is the correct one. At this point, some ontological realist philosophers like Timothy Williamson seek to mimic science and propose a principled way of determining ontology via the methods of theory choice. He puts forward this methodology in a recent book he wrote on metaphysics where he says, the methodology of this book is akin to that of a natural science. The theories are judged partly on their strength, simplicity and elegance, partly on the fit between their consequences and what is independently known. Basically, the idea is to accept the theory that is able to express the greatest number of known truths while being as elegant as possible and committing to the fewest number of entities. Once you have that theory, you can read off what exists from that theory, because they will be the things that that theory talks about. People who take this approach appeal to principles like Occam's razor, which says you shouldn't multiply entities beyond what is necessary. So if you have unnecessary entities floating around in your theory, you should get rid of them for the sake of simplicity. And since, by hypothesis, we are determining what exists by our best theory, that means that these entities, therefore, don't exist. Now I think this whole approach is wrong. Very popular, but completely wrong. It tries to determine things like truth and existence by using values of a completely different kind. Strength, elegance and parsimony are aesthetic and pragmatic features of a theory, and they have nothing at all to do with truth. Having fewer entities in your theory is certainly very useful in a theory. The more entities you have floating around, the more complicated it is to use that theory to make predictions. And there is a certain aesthetic quality that comes with a theory that is particularly strong and yet simple to describe. But so what? Why should practical matters about which kind of theory is more useful have anything to do with what's true or what exists? Why should we think reality is more likely to be simple than complex? And why should we expect reality to mirror our most beautiful and simple theories? As far as I'm concerned, we shouldn't. The idea that pragmatic and aesthetic concerns of theory choice have any bearing on the deep nature of what there is, is utterly groundless. As my favourite philosopher F.H. Bradley might say, such an approach to try and understand reality is barbarous metaphysics. Truth needs no ground. Truth is its own ground. It's not propped up by aesthetics and pragmatics. Besides, if you take the ontological realist approach, you end up having to pit theories against each other and make a choice. For example, biologists talk about DNA, but physicists don't. So does DNA exist or not? Or what about psychologists that talk about beliefs and desires? Do these exist? Or maybe we should read our ontology from economics and say there are entities such as dollars and market crashes. You get the point. Perhaps we might hold out hope for some grand scientific theory that can be deployed in all contexts, including biology, psychology and economics. But the evidence of that happening is not great so far. We seem to be proliferating scientific disciplines and not merging them. And although it might be assumed that physics is the one science to rule them all, such that all scientific truths are actually physical truths, that assumption is a complete act of faith especially given the now incompatible theories of quantum mechanics and physics incredible reliance on the truths of mathematics. And to those that then shift focus to mathematics and say things like, everything is just numbers, I can only reply with what in philosophy is called the incredulous stare. I honestly have no idea how anyone could believe that reality is purely quantitative and contains no quality. Do they not have feelings? In the words of George Orwell, some ideas are so stupid that only intellectuals believe them. Fortunately, there is an alternative way to interpret Quine's dictum that to be is to be the value of a bound variable that doesn't lead to the pickle I've just described. And, incidentally, is the view to which Quine himself was eventually led. Under this alternative interpretation, 
Rather than think that what you talk about in your theory has some deep ontological commitment with great implications for what exists, you can turn it around and say that there's nothing really to existence other than being something you happen to talk about in a given theory. The correspondence relation still holds, kind of, but the order is reversed. Talk about what you like in your theory, it doesn't really matter. Sure, you're committing to the existence of these things, but that isn't a commitment deserving of much weight. Existence is a thin, derivative notion, a mere byproduct of a theory's way of speaking. You choose a theory because it's the most insightful way to talk about whatever it is you want to talk about. And questions of what exists can only meaningfully be posed within a theory by those that already adopt that theoretical framework. There are then no questions about what ultimately, really, or absolutely exists. So what does this alternative perspective mean? It means that electrons exist, physically speaking, just as DNA exists, biologically speaking. But then God exists, theologically speaking, and perhaps even Frodo exists, Lord of the Rings speaking. The moral is to relax about existence and to ask better questions. The better question I'm going to ask at this point is that if we adopt this thin notion of existence I'm suggesting, what does that tell us about the nature of existence, objects and facts? Well, to consider this question further, I've got an object lesson. How many objects are there in front of me? You might think the answer is simple. There are three, of course. One, two, three. But in philosophy, nothing is that simple. Some might argue there are, in fact, seven objects in front of me. There's this object, this object, and that object. Then there's the object you get by combining these two, the one by combining these two, and the one by combining these two. That makes six objects. And then you have to add the seventh object, which is the object you get by combining all three together. Others would argue there must be at least six objects because there's this half and this half, there's this half and this half, this half and this half. That makes six apple half objects. But then apples can be halved in many ways, which means there must be... Um, lots of objects. What I'm getting at here is a question of myriology, which is the philosophy of parts and wholes. If an object has parts, those parts must also be objects. And if objects combine into a whole, that whole must also be an object too. Now, if you think reality has a certain structure to it, you think there must be a definitive answer to how many objects there are. There must be, because reality contains a certain structure, which means there must be a certain number of objects in that structure. That's what a real structure is. But as Peter van Inwagen expertly lays out in his book Material Beings, it turns out to be very difficult to say when objects combine into other objects in a way that matches our intuitions. So by far the most popular myriological positions in philosophy are myriological nihilism and myriological universalism. And these two positions represent the extremes. The myriological nihilist says that objects never combine to form new objects, and objects don't have proper parts either, so all objects are simple. The myriological nihilist typically thinks that the simple objects in reality are the fundamental particles of standard model physics. So it's myriological nihilists that want to do things like switch talk of computers and tables into talk of particles arranged computer-wise and table-wise. Myriological universalists, on the other hand, are at the other end of the spectrum. They argue that objects always combine to form new objects. So sure, there are computers and tables, but then there are much weirder objects as well, such as this apple, Shakespeare's favourite quill, the fourth moon of Jupiter, and your socks. Given that according to ontological realism, at most one of the myriological nihilist and myriological universalist can be right, philosophers on either team battle it out. Myriological nihilists argue that there can't possibly be things like computers and tables, while the myriological universalists say that there can be objects more bizarre and cobbled together than you could possibly imagine. But we've been down this ontological realism route before, and we know that nothing good comes of it. 
So where does that leave us? It leaves us with a far more reasonable way of saying how many objects there are here. And that is, it depends. There are no absolute quantities in the world because reality doesn't come pre-packaged with a certain kind of independent structure. There are only quantities relative to the concepts we use to structure the world of experience. Uh, here's what I mean. If you ask me how many objects there are in front of me, I can only give you an answer once I know what concept I'm using to count things. If the concept is the concept of being an apple, then it's simple. I know how to count apples. The answer is three. One, two, three. If, however, the concept is top or bottom apple halves, then there are six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Or consider this deck of cards in my hand. How many things are there? Once again, it's going to depend on the concepts I use to count things. If I'm using the concept of complete decks, the answer is one. If I'm using the concept of playing cards, the answer is 52. If I'm using the concept of suits, the answer is four. And if I'm using the concept of fundamental particles, the answer is lots. The deck of cards example was used by, you may have guessed, Frege. And he used it to show that quantity was not a property of objects themselves. He thought that quantity only came into play once we had carved reality up with our concepts, and that quantity was actually a property of the concepts we used to carve reality and not of objects themselves. Concepts that can be used to count things this way are called sortal concepts. And you understand a sortal concept when you know what it takes to be one of those things and how to count them. For example, you know what the sortal concept apple is once you can recognize an apple and know how to count them. One way to go from here is to say that it is our sortal concepts that carves reality up into objects and provides it with a structure it doesn't have in and of itself. Once those concepts have done their structuring work, then, and only then, there can be definitive answers about quantities of objects. This idea heavily suggests that quantities are not things we encounter in the world itself, but are only parts of the way we mentally structure that world with our concepts. Some philosophers, like Immanuel Kant, go even further and say that this explains the certainty we find in mathematics. Mathematics isn't about the world itself, it's about the way we mentally structure the world with our concepts. Because mathematical truths are about the structure of our thought, they are independent of how the world happens to be. And that is why, he says, we don't discover them by going out into the world and doing experiments. So far, I have argued for two main theses. The first was that truth bearers are thoughts. They are the things that we believe, and the things that we say, and the meanings of our sentences. Further, I have claimed that, although thoughts are public entities, they are nevertheless in the mind. Second, I have argued that structure is not a feature of reality independently of our theories and ways of conceptualizing it. Rather, structure is something imposed on reality in our theories and language you use to describe them. And since structure is required for counting things and for saying what exists, the features we typically associate with matters of fact, such as what exists and how many things there are, are not features of the world independently of language theories and concepts, but are instead features of language theories and concepts. Putting these insights together, the most natural thing to do is to say, as Frege does, that facts are thoughts. Facts are the true thoughts. Facts are structured entities, just like thoughts are. And, just like thoughts, that means that facts are public entities that exist within the eternal mind. Now, I said at the beginning of this video that if we accept that facts are in the mind, and if we accept Wittgenstein's claim that the world is the totality of facts, then we can establish idealism. So, does this mean I can now take Wittgenstein's Tractarian step and establish idealism? Unfortunately, no. I don't think that facts are the totality of the world. For me, the idea that reality is merely factual is an impoverished view. Not all conscious experience is contained within thought, 
We also experience a world of our senses. We experience emotions, desires, will, moral duties, and so forth. I haven't even begun to integrate these aspects of human experience into an idealist worldview. But when I do, they won't fundamentally be facts. Don't get me wrong, I am what I think is best described as an idealist. And the view that facts are thoughts in the mind is a central pillar of my idealism. It's just not the whole story. So far, I haven't stated what my position on truth is. I've just said that it grounds itself and doesn't rely on notions of simplicity, elegance or strength. But a clear understanding of the notion of truth is required for any idealist position. At least I think so. Nor have I talked about the clear link between the world of thought and the world we experience through our senses which is also highly relevant. But discussion of these important topics will have to wait for other videos. There simply isn't enough time to cover everything at once. What I can say so far is that facts are in the mind. And I consider this to be a big step forward in the idealist direction. For information about my views on these other areas, you'll need to subscribe, enable notifications, and keep checking back for when I start to talk about them. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to talk philosophy with me or have some lessons, I'm making myself available for a limited number of slots each week for one-on-one -on -one discussions. If that interests you, you can book a slot using the link in the description, or you can email me if you'd like to set up something regular. I also have a membership program where I deep dive into some of my favorite philosophical books and have other exclusive video content. And if you want to keep the discussion going, this video explores some of the themes I've been talking about over this last hour. Until the next time, friends, keep thinking.